Dale Messick exhibit. Um, this is my grandma, Dale Messick, and I'm Laura Rorman, her granddaughter, and I'm the co-curator, and this is some of my art is involved. This is Robert Pollock. Robert is a big fan of Brenda Starr, and he taught Brenda Starr and um, worked with Dale Messick a lot in his classes when he was an art teacher, so take it away. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today. I was fortunate enough to meet Dale Messick several times and became friends with her, and I've collected her art. Um, she was a terrific person, very creative, and when I went into education and teaching, she became pen pals with many of my students, which fine-tuned our uh, letter writing skills, and then we also used some of her great stories, especially from the 40s and the mid-60s that we both loved, uh, as genre studies for literature. So the comic strips came into the classroom and worked very well to uh, get the students excited about writing and reading and communicating. But right now, I just want to uh, read a letter that Dale wrote to me when I was teaching. She wrote, tell your class that I was in fifth grade when I created my first comic strip at the age of 10. It took until I was 34 before I created Brenda Starr. Now I'm 88 years old and still making funnies because I love to draw fashions and tell stories. Love to all my fans, Dale Messick, 1994. And here's a drawing that Dale did with the letter. And this is a letter that I think is real special. And uh, I love that she did the drawing for, for me and the students. It's just a terrific memento. Now I'm going to talk about a few pieces of art in the collection. So if you follow me this way. Uh, these two pieces from 1968, this is the time I was reading it, and I really like this artwork of this time period, and this has Brenda Starr with Basil St. John, her mystery man, and uh, it's signed to me from Brenda Starr and Dale Messick, and it's two of my favorite pieces from the collection. And Dale took her characters on lots of adventures around the world and always lots of drama and the facial expressions. You know, no basil. I don't have smallpox. I'm just tired. I've got a lot of thinking to do. And basil, thinking about what? So there was always a little cliffhanger, even in the daily strips. Over here is a 1966 Sunday page. Dale, every year, would do a Happy Holiday or Seasons greeting page that had all the characters that appeared in the comic strip from that year. So here you have, of course, Brenda on top of the Christmas tree, the mystery man, the black orchid, and all the supporting characters of the year. Now this is cut and pasted up like a collage, because what they did is, she did it for a full page format, and then Tribune Media Services would cut up the original, re-glue it and format it, so it would be a third page, a quarter of a page, a half page, so it would appear in different newspapers in different sizes. So most of her original artwork up into a certain date, like I'd say the late, mm, early 70s, late 60s, was actually cut and reformatted for the Sunday strip, so it would go into uh, different papers with different sizes. Now we're going to move over here, and uh, this one on the bottom is really a, a very sweet one, and it's from 1946, and it has Pierre Pallet, Hank O'Hare, and Brenda Starr. And here you see Brenda Starr looking very much like Rita Hayworth, and Rita Hayworth was one of the inspirations for Brenda Starr. And Hank O'Hare, if you look at Hank O'Hare, the name Hank and the uh, cap, the artist cap that Hank is wearing, and the blazer, a lot of people, especially children reading Brenda Starr, thought Hank was a man. But actually, Hank O'Hare was a tough female reporter, and uh, she was from another newspaper and came over to The Flash, which is Brenda Starr's newspaper, and became part of the Flash reporter crew. So Brenda and Hank were co-reporters, and Pierre Pallet eventually married Hank O'Hare, and uh, they lived happily ever have after. You know, so uh, Hank was the strong arm of the Flash, and Brenda was the on-location reporter. And going above this to 1954, here's two sequential daily strips. And again, Dale loved fashion, so you'll notice 
Brenda's always dressed in the style of the times, and this is 1954. And here Brenda has a face kind of like Marilyn Monroe, and a little less like Rita Hayworth, but a little like Marilyn Monroe. And uh, here she's a news hound, as Dale would call her. Brenda was a news hound. She's sniffing around for a story and trying to make a deal so she could get her byline on the front page of The Flash. Okay, thank you. We're going to go around this corner. Over here, this is a hand watercolored Sunday page. And this one is from 1947. And Brenda is homeless with her cousin, A Breath of Breeze. And Dale once told me the story how she got A Breath of Breeze's name. She was living in New York, opened up the balcony doors on a hot New York summer night. And uh, she said, I need a breath of breeze because it was so hot and humid. So she named Brenda's cousin A Breath of Breeze. And here they are apartment hunting, and they're even looking in Brenda's newspaper, The Flash, for where to find an apartment. And then they find something, a penthouse, and it's $75. <laughs> and she goes, oh my goodness, a week? No, that's for a month. $75 for a penthouse in New York City uh, monthly. That was not bad. So they move in, and another story begins. And here's her little dog, Tornado, which is very cute. You see Tornado over here and over here. Real cute dog character. Look at the detail. Yeah, there's so a lot of... De it's so beautiful. It is beautiful, and Dale was a master with watercolor, too. She really did a beautiful job coloring this in. And then underneath it, we have a nice piece. This is earlier, before the Daily Strips. This, I think, is 1944, if I remember correctly. Yep, 1944, the tagline. And this is before the Mystery Man, Basil St. John. Brenda's at the Flash with Hank O'Hare. They're talking about stories and what they're going to do to get a scoop. And here's Brenda, kind of looking again like Rita Hayworth, which she was based on her and uh, uh, another society lady from that time. And uh, this is Tom Taylor. This was Brenda's boyfriend on the newspaper before she met the mystery man. But Brenda was never sure about Tom Taylor. So uh, Hank said, we were going to be hitched. Is she right or wrong, Brenda? Right, I guess. Darling, when? Oh, someday, Tom, someday. I think this is very interesting because a year later she's with the mystery man and he's married to someone else. But this was Brenda Starr's first boyfriend, Tom Taylor. I'd like to just finish for this section and read you something that Brenda, uh, that was in the Brenda Starr comics that Dale Messick had said to me several times, and it was in one of the comic strips actually, uh, Dale would always say, we're all real live dolls and have to age, but Brenda is a paper doll and never grows old. And uh, Dale was a very good storyteller, a very clever lady, and I'm just honored to have known her and have these pieces in my collection, and I'm able to loan them here for everyone to see. Now I'd like you to meet Laura and let her take the rest of the show and talk about her grandmother. Thank you. I'm curious. Hi. <laughs> I'm Laura. I'm curious. I wanted to ask you a question. Oh, okay. Um, when did you start uh, reading Brenda Starr? I started in the mid-1960s. Okay. And that's why the ones from 68 are my favorite. And actually, when I spoke to your grandmother, she, I said, what was your favorite time period? She said the mid to late 60s. She and, and She loved the mid to late right. 60s, and I love that time period, too. And that's, that's why I grew up on Brenda Starr. I think that was probably the peak of its popularity at that time. But I also love the 1940s. The 40s have oh, yeah. a I mean, she, she really had the fashion. Mm -hmm. um, she had the style of every single decade, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. And I kind of came around later, obviously, because I didn't meet Dale until I think she was in her, she was in her 70s when I was born. But you would never know that. She was, when I was a teenager, I would have thought, you know, she was a young woman, she was spry, she was always well coiffed, always had her hair done, always dressed to the nines. So I met my grandma, and we always had a special connection. I loved art when I was little, and um, I feel like she really wanted me to tell her story someday. And it took me a while to grow up to do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> but she, she has a good story to tell. She was a very talented and clever woman. You're blessed to have 
ever as a grandma. <laughs> so, so at some point when when um, Grandma was really when Grandma Dale was really old, let me take you back. Let's just take you back to the picture was what I remember growing up, was we would come to, Grandma lived in Chicago, I lived in California, we would come and she was always having something exciting going on. There was a camera crew, she had a beautiful apartment, and she looked like this, and I can remember her showing me how to put on mascara. And she said, only a true artist can really put on mascara, which I've learned because I'm not so great at it. So, um, so this is my, um, my brother and I when we were little and we were on her desk. This is the very first Brenda Starr strip, isn't it? Isn't this right? Uh, this is the very first it's one. This the first is the story. This is the first but story. It's half of it because it was, it's, it's half of the whole thing. So yeah. this storyline is um, basically how Brenda gets her very first story. And it's a good one, and it's a and she's hiding out in a jail cell. This is the the very first Brenda Starr storyline, and this is the one that would have hooked the readers because Brenda Starr got started. It was in a contest with sixteen other strips, and um, she was the only strip that made it out of that contest and was turned into a real comic. So it was boundary breaking. She was the first syndicated female cartoonist really in the world because Brenda Starr went on to be syndicated and it was the only adventure strip that was made by a woman. Um, not well known because she was in there with Terry and the Pirates um, and other adventure strips and they just kind of said her name, Dale Messick, and you wouldn't have even known it was a woman, right? Right. So um, then let's go on and then this is some, this is some Brenda Starr um, things that were part of, maybe you can talk a little bit about this, Robert, because I don't... Well, these were comic book... book these were comic books that Brenda Starr appeared in, and a lot of different artists did the covers, but inside was the reformatted Sunday Story. strips. Yeah, That's the what stories. I thought. I yeah. thought that this wasn't... Because these, are, wasn't, these are not... This is a famous cover. I forget the name of the artist who did this, but these are... Uh, famous artists did these Brenda Starr covers, but this, this one, one is... This one is definitely by Dale. And this one is Dale. by Dale, because these are right off the strip in the reprints. This one, this one is too. You think that one is? Yeah, well, it says Dale Messick, and that looks like... A Brenda Starr that she would have done, some, but these don't. These, these actually don't. Exactly. Look like. These are um, other artists so in the comic book industry. Yes. Going this to going this direction. This is what Dale looked like when she first came to New York City, um, and she first came here when she was about um, thirty three years old, and she worked in a greeting card. She worked in the greeting card business, but basically she had had a job in Chicago. She'd had a job in Chicago, and uh, her boss uh, wanted to pay her less. And um, I think that the that he wanted to pay her thirty dollars a week, and she was going from thirty three to thirty dollars a week, and she jumped up and quit. Well, this was in the middle of the depression, and um, she went back home to Indiana, and her brothers made her an art studio out of a barn. And she was creating greeting cards and sending them into a New York City studio. And then they offered her a job, and she came here, and all the while she was coming up with her ideas for a comic strip, and different comic strips at the time. Streamline Babies. Streamline Babies was the first one. She also had one about a mermaid, yes. the mermaids. And she came to New York City, and she was trying to peddle these, as she would say, she would, she would tell the story, I was peddling my craft. She was out doing this, but most of the time the men that she was meeting with, it was all men, would ask her out to lunch. She didn't get very far, but she did get pretty far with Streamline Babies, and she actually, they actually were going to buy it. They did buy it. I mean, I think they, they, they did buy it, and then they shelved the whole idea for a cartoon about um, a dummy. Oh, uh, Edgar Bergen. Uh, yes. And she was very, you know, very depressed about it and uh, went on. And it wasn't too much later that somebody showed her the contest page, which is where she got Brenda Starr started. And then it went on from there. And she got back to that contest page, which I was just showing you about. So this was her uh, boyfriend at the time. This is C.D. Batchelor. He actually won the Pulitzer Prize in cartooning in 1937. So he helped her a lot. He's the one who showed her the contest page to get going and he was in, um, so this is in 1934, and his, he, they, he was also working in the Daily News. So the editor at the Daily News, the big editor, was Joseph Patterson, uh, but his right-hand lady was Molly Slot. 
So this is many years later after Joseph Patterson had died, but you can see that, the, that she was the sole woman because she was an editor. She was the sole woman cartoonist in, uh, you know, with a gaggle of men. And uh, look, let's see, uh, Frank King, Zach Mosley, who wrote Smiling, uh, Gasoline Alley, um, Molly Slot was in this. Um, and then up here, who was in this? The Gumps was a popular comic strip at the time. So she was in a lot of these events with all men. And then now I'll take you to the Sparky storyline. So uh, this was, maybe should we start from down here and come forward? But this storyline was my grandmother taking me when I was about, um, when I was in my 20s. And she said, I had just started, I'm a playwright, and I had just started writing plays. And she said, I have a great idea for a play for you. It's, um, there's a junkyard, and there's a character named Sparky. And she was telling me this whole story. Now let's come take a look at some of these drawings. She said, okay, look at this junkyard. She's, she's, she's explaining this to me, but I had, there's 40 years of Brenda Starr comics. So I have no idea what she's talking about. We didn't have it in front of us. Here you go, look, pop. It's true, they're coming. Who's coming? Them reporters from the newspaper. <laughs> She was great at dialogue, too. And here's Sparky. Sparky! Yeah, what do you want? So there's what Sparky looked like. So I have no idea what she's talking about. And then, um, meanwhile, she wants me to write a play about this. And she said, I can see the stage. It'll be filled with junk. So the storyline in this Sparky strip is that Sparky's junkyard is going to be flooded. And uh, we can come back and take a look. Was Sparky like the Cinderella type story? Yes, yes. she loved the she Cinder. Loved she stuff, loved the yeah. rags to riches stories. Um, she loved somebody, uh, you know, turning into something you wouldn't suspect. Uh, oh, here's a funny one. Look at the Sparky inside the car. Sparky crawling around. Oh, okay, and then the wrench. So. Once again, a big black greasy wrench flies through the air like a gilded, like a guided missile. Wrong, bonks her in the head. But this time it hits a tender mark and she's passed out. Love the glasses, very 1960s. So years later, um, I wrote a play about Dale's life uh, that um, has a lot of her story in it with meeting C.D. Batchelor and Molly Slot, and it was missing a comic element. So after Grandma passed away, my brother had these comics, apparently. They were supposed to be given away, and my brother loves junkyards. So he saved them, and he pulled them out for me, and he, not knowing that I talked to my grandma, said, I think this would make a good story for a play. I'm getting chills up the back of my neck. I, uh, and he's telling me the whole story just like my grandma did. He said, Sparky, the wrench. Um, let's come look some more at some of the favorite parts. And he was so enthralled with the cars. He couldn't believe the great detail on all of the cars in the junkyard. My brother's name is Kurt, by the way, and he would love that he was a part of this. He has a junkyard. <laughs> Uh, so it was hard for him to part with these, I'm sure, but he didn't know where to put them. Uh, oh, and he loved this part too, and he made a point of telling me about this. See the hard hat? This is an example of um, how innovative and how on the mark Dale was with her art and her fashion. This thing, and it was in the newspapers, and Dale was right, it was adding them into her strip. So she read the newspaper cover to cover. She knew everything that was going on, and she would... Um, add these little details so that you know you would see oh wow hard hats were just created and then here she so in this storyline um, Sparky turns into a girl as you can see and look at beautiful Brenda in the raincoat outfit well, Brenda's going to help her become Brent. beautiful because yeah. it's a, a Cinderella kind of story which is great Brenda's always Brent, and then that was my grandmother telling me how Brenda fixed she got her teeth fixed <laughs> so here's some, some more Sparky on the run. Here's a good one of Sparky on the run. And these strips are from 1965. 
So this is indicative of this, and this strip lasted for usually uh, for four months. A storyline would go on. Here's a beautiful Brenda. And here she is. Here's the, fa the fashion in honor of Fashion Week. And no one could draw Brenda Starr's face the way Dale did it. There was a lot of lines there, but all the lines were in the right places. The other artists that came after her were very talented and very good, but only Dale could master Brenda Starr's face. Oh, look. Look at this outfit. Oh, here's when the teeth come out. So this is all in the play. This whole storyline is in one of the plays where the wrench, where Sparky takes the, um, the tooth out with a wrench. Okay. And oh, look at the carrot. Look at the carrot. The Halloween. More cars. And here you have someone coming on to Brenda. And I think that's really, the, really interesting. Either way, you're gorgeous. And he's just grabbing her and she's going, no, Del, please remember we're having dinner together because of Basil St. John, the man I love. He doesn't care, but this is a situation Brenda always got into. <laughs> oh, yeah. So do you remember the storyline? Or was this before you started reading it? This was a little it? before. Okay. Yes, yes. Whenever we start reading, when, whenever there are old comic strips, like in the book downstairs, if you start looking through it, you just get hooked immediately. It's just great. Well, that has a great it's, story. It's the, great Beast, the Beastly Twins. That's right. a take off on Beauty and the Beast. That's really, really good. Again, the, the face. With, yeah, it's just beautiful work on the face and the eyelashes. and. I think some of her assistant artists did the background. I think so. Especially by the 60s. Right, John, o did, John, John Olson. Olson. Yes, John Olson did a lot of backgrounds, definitely. Usually the, the fine cross hatching was John Olson. Probably some of the cars. Yes, yes. And what's also interesting is some of the other supporting characters with these hairdos. Look, it, it's like she has a pin that looks like music notes are in there. It almost looks like something from Star Trek. But some of the supporting characters have these wild outfits also. And here, actually, Brenda's in her negligee, and she's helping Sparky become beautiful. And it looks like it's going to be a really big job. <laughs> <laughs> to fix, she got her teeth fixed. So, great. so you can imagine she actually told me this whole story. From the beginning, the junkyard, I knew all the characters. So when when the discovery of, of all of these comics, it was just crazy. And now the note, the little notes on here, maybe you can speak a little bit about this. She would send them into the Tribune. Right, these are editorial uh, comments where they're uh, fixing grammar or changing the, the sentence slightly to read more clearly. So there's a lot of editor notes and pasteovers uh, for editorial corrections. You know, how would that go, because you might know a little bit more about this, how would that go in those days, if they did these corrections, then how, how, would it, how would it make it to the printed page? They would just... Well, Dale would probably send in the finished piece, and the editors would have to sign off on each one. See, there's the signature, okay. and they'd make the corrections and give it to a lettering person to say, let's make this sentence this, and glue it right over and paste it over. Sometimes with the hyphen was left out or something. Attempts or... to get her first real interview with Sparky. Right. It might have said something similar, but the editor wanted it to be more clearly. And that might have been Molly's slot, right? I wish it, was, I, it would be great if we could see Molly's slots. There it is. M MS. Molly slot, her editor. Yeah. So her editor in the play, the editor, you get to, you mm -hmm. get to meet this editor in the story, and you're following this storyline. So I feel like I know them all from writing about them. <laughs> There's definitely a lot to look at and a lot of story behind the story. And also the production of it. It's a lot of hard work. Everything by hand. Everything. Amazing. So is there any... Hi! You need to come through. It's okay. I'm so sorry. Come through. <laughs> it's 
So let's see, here's another outfit. Ooh, that's an interesting outfit. What's that one? Look at, look, look, look at the hair. So 1960s. All right. Do we do what else do we have to talk about in our... All right. Well, um, the, I am going to have a reading of the play um, on March 11th, uh, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a private reading for investors, but there might be a few spaces for real, real fans. So you might want to get in touch with the museum and ask about it. It's, there's going to be one at 12.30 and one at 6.30 on March 11th. So if you are interested, we can probably just have them... Um, email uh, the information at the Society of Illustrators, and thank you so much, Robert. Robert, you've been thank such you, a big, we've you. been such a big help uh, thank you, thank you. getting this <laughs> getting this exhibit up, and um, I'm so happy it's here. Thank you. It's a pleasure.